Terrible Typhoid Mary, Chapter 6, in which Mary walks more like a man than a woman. George Sopper fled. He raced outside, through the basement door, ran through the tall iron gate at the front of the property, and didn't stop until he hit Park Avenue. When he recounted the incident, Sopper didn't say whether Mary chased him with a carving fork, and if she did, how far he ran. But he did say, I felt rather lucky to escape. Sopper was not a large man, one year younger than Mary. He was of average height and had a slender build. Bitterly, he explained that Mary was a large and very strong woman. She was five feet, six inches tall, he said. Mary had a good figure and might have been called athletic had she not been a little too heavy. She prided herself on her strength and endurance. He went on to say that Mary was at the height of her physical and mental faculties and that she had used rough language. Her behavior shocked Sopper. It also hardened his attitude toward her. In his worldview, no true or proper woman would act the way she did. Many people from the middle and upper classes would have agreed with him. The dominant social view at this time held that a proper woman should be pious, pure, domestic, and submissive. Mary did not fit this ideal. She was strong and tough. She had a temper. She swore. She threatened him. Sopper concluded that Mary Mallon was more like a man than a woman. Nothing was so distinctive about Mary as her walk unless it was her mind, he said. The two, her walk and mind, shared a peculiar co communion. Those who knew her best said Mary not only walked more like a man than a woman, but also that her mind had a distinctly masculine character. It's true that Mary was a strong woman. She wasn't submissive. She was stalwart and brave and not afraid to stand up for herself, even if it meant a fight. She had crossed the Atlantic Ocean alone as a young teenager. When her aunt and uncle died, she fended for herself in a large foreign city, she had probably done lots of hard domestic jobs as she worked her way up to the station of cook. In 1907, society had strict ideas about womanhood and marriage, too, based on something called the middle class ideal. This ideal said that a proper woman should be married and have children, that she should be a good mother and the foundation of the home, that she should not work outside the home, that she should tend to the needs of her husband and children, that the welfare of society and even the fate of a nation depended on her. A woman like Mary didn't fit this ideal. Like most Irish immigrant women living in New York City at the time, she wasn't married. Neither were more than 50% of women her age who were living in Ireland. Young girls and unmarried women were encouraged to immigrate. As a cook, Mary earned more than other domestics, but she would never earn enough to become a middle-class woman. Mary needed her job. She needed her wages. She wasn't going to let George Sopper harass her at her place of work or interfere with her livelihood. George Sopper didn't consider these things, or if he did, he dismissed them. To him, Mary was unreasonable. As an engineer, he liked to solve problems. Once he presented the facts of the case, he expected Mary to understand the problem and to agree with him. I expected to find a person who would be as desirous as I was for an answer, he wrote later. Mary's reaction baffled him. I suppose that she would be glad to know the truth, he wrote. I thought I could count on her cooperation in clearing up some of the mystery which surrounded her past. I hoped that we, that I, might work out together the complete history of the case and make suitable plans for the protection of her associates in the future. He wanted to save her from her carrier state. He wanted to teach her the proper hygiene methods in order to protect the families for whom she worked and he expected her to be grateful for his help. The sharp times of Mary's carving fork said otherwise. I never felt more hopeless, said Sopper after he left empty-handed. Sopper may have felt hopeless, but he wasn't giving up. He felt certain that he had gathered enough epidemiological evidence to prove that Mary was spreading the killer disease. At this point, however, the evidence that Mary Mellon caused typhoid wherever she worked was circumstantial. The fact that she happened to work at places where typhoid fever broke out did not prove that she caused the outbreaks. The outbreaks may have been a coincidence. The fact that Mary escaped the illness herself wasn't proof either, nor was the fact that she left her employment soon after typhoid broke out. But these facts, and her behavior, convinced Sopper that Mary Mellon was a menace to the public health. The circumstantial nature of the evidence did not deter him. As a matter of fact, I did not need the specimens in order to prove that Mary was a focus of typhoid germs, he said. My epidemiological evidence had proved that. Sopper was wrong. 
He didn't need the specimens. As scientists and statisticians know, correlation does not imply causation. So far, he had only established a pattern that put Mary at the scene of the outbreaks. He needed the specimens to prove that Mary had caused the outbreaks. But he did not have the authority to force Mary to comply. No sanitary engineer did. Only the powerful New York City Board of Health had that authority. That raises this question. If Sopper was certain that he had the epidemiological evidence, why didn't he report Mary to the health authorities right away? Perhaps in order to convince the health officials that something needed to be done, he needed direct evidence, the specimens that linked Mary to the typhoid cases. Or perhaps he didn't want to share the credit for discovering the first healthy carrier in the United States. Whatever his reason, Sopper doesn't say. He decided to act on his own. If he couldn't persuade Mary in the Bowen's kitchen, perhaps she'd be more willing to listen someplace else. Once more, George Sopper worked like a detective. I found that Mary was in a habit of going, when her work for the day was finished, to a rooming house on 3rd Avenue below 3rd Street. He recounted, he doesn't state how he found this out. It is likely that as she left the kitchen of the Park Avenue house, he followed her for 39 blocks all the way to the rooming house. Perhaps he stood beneath the elevated train tracks that rose above 3rd Avenue and watched as she left herself, let herself inside. This raised his suspicions about Mary. May Sopper snooped around the neighborhood asking questions. He learned that an out-of-work policeman known as August Brehoff lived on the top floor and that Mary often visited Brehoff, bringing him dinner, most likely leftovers from the Park Avenue kitchen. Sopper didn't approve of Mary's visits. She was spending the evenings with a disreputable-looking man who had a room on the top floor, Sopper wrote. His headquarters during the day was a saloon on the corner. While Mary was at work, Sopper befriended Brehoff. Perhaps he bought Mary's friend a drink or two at the saloon. Perhaps he waited until Brehoff had too much to drink. However, it happened. Sopper convinced Mary's friend to show him the room where he lived. Sopper followed Brehoff to the top floor of the rooming house, where Brehoff opened the door to his room. Sopper was disgusted by what he saw. I should not care to see another like it, he wrote. It was a place of dirt and disorder. We didn't know much about August Brehoff. New York City directories for the year 1903 to 1908 list his occupation as policeman. From census, census records, it seems that he was born in Manhattan in 1856, making him 51 years old when Sopper met him. From Sopper, we learned that Brehoff was out of work, lived in a rundown flat, and spent too much time drinking. His only friends in the world were Mary Mallon and a large motley dog. From Sopper, we also learned that August Brehoff had a heart condition. Recent historians speculate that Mary must have loved Brehoff, despite his faults. She brought him supper. She was fond of his dog. She overlooked the fact that he spent his days in a saloon and drank too much and didn't work. Some claim that Mary lived with Brehoff, although Sopper states only that she spent her evenings with him. Others suggest that Mary may have paid his rent and given him drinking money. From Sopper's accounts, we know that Mary's friendship with Brehoff and her fondness for his big dog disgusted Sopper. Sopper doesn't speculate on how Mary Mallon could have cooked for Brehoff, yet not made him sick. It's possible that Brehoff had recovered from typhoid at some point in his life and was naturally immune, just as Mary's former employer, J. Coleman Drayton, was. Sopper convinced Brehoff to allow him to wait for Mary after work. We don't know what Sopper said or did to convince Brehoff. Perhaps Brehoff was drunk. Perhaps Sopper slipped him a few dollars. Perhaps Sopper wasn't forthright about his intentions. However, it happened. The two men set a meeting time and Sopper left. This time, Sopper vowed to do better. He would be more patient with Mary. He would choose better words and speak more carefully. He would use as much tact and good judgment as he could muster. He would plan out what he'd say and rehearse the words. I wanted to make sure she understood what I meant, said Sopper, and that I meant her no harm. But he wouldn't face Mary Mallon alone. He would bring an associate. And that's where we will stop.